A map is more than simply longitude and latitude. In the hands of an adventurous spirit, it is the first page, an invitation that beckons to be part of something bigger. A narrative unfolding with moments so exhilarating, magical, and rare, you'll wish they'd never end. Nor will they, for these are the stories that last. We have such maps. They speak of mystery and adventures of the heart. Maps here not merely to be read, but acted upon. Bring us your curiosity and passion for the wild places. Bring us your restless and inquisitive soul. And together, as explorers guiding explorers, we will venture further to create stories every bit worthy of the telling. So let me introduce our first speaker. So Alison, uh, she is she is the expedition leader uh, and a quad academy trainer in quad expeditions. So uh, she has been to Antarctica for since 2012, and she can speak Mandarin too. So I think without further ado, let me uh, hand the back over to Alison to share with you more uh, stories about Antarctica. Uh, Alison, over to you. Hello everybody, thank you very much Kok Yong and thank you to uh, Intrigue for letting, uh, letting me speak to you all tonight. I'm, I'm really, really pleased you've joined us and uh, I can't wait to tell you a little bit about Antarctica. Uh, so firstly, by way of introduction, I'm an expedition leader with Quark Expeditions in the Antarctic and the Arctic and I did my first trip to Antarctica or oh, nine or ten years ago now and it, it fundamentally changed me. It really took me on a different path in life. And uh, I, was, I was there with my family as well. And I was able to witness just this, this incredible transformation as we all experienced one of the most beautiful, uh, incredible remote wildernesses in the world. And I, whenever I go back to Antarctica, I remember that. And I remember the power that the, the gorgeous places in the the wild polar regions have on us. Um, but of course, with that power uh, has to come great humility. And although I'm incredibly familiar with all the places that we visit in Antarctica and, uh, and the surrounding regions, and I understand the opportunities that are available to us there, 
uh, I, I'm never there without respect because as soon as as soon as you show any arrogance, Mother Nature will will very quickly remind you that that she's in charge. Thankfully, uh, humility was something that I'd learned well before going to Antarctica when uh, I served for almost 20 years full time in the Australian military, and and this set me up very well because I was able to use those really strong organizational skills and, um, and risk assessment skills and, and teamwork and, and was very familiar with operating in inst- extreme environments. So I use all those skills to, uh, to keep you safe and, and work with the elements to effectively give you the trip of a lifetime. And, and that's what I really want to convey tonight, that uh, a trip to Antarctica is, is the trip of a lifetime and, and can really change you. Um, so this first slide that, that Kok Young's put up for us uh, is, is quite a busy one. Uh, and it really just gives us gives a lot of reasons why you would want to travel with Quark expeditions. Um, so if you want me to talk about anything specific, please just pop a question in the Q&A box. But I will tell you what really resonates with me. And I suppose one of the biggest ones is that we have the most incredible expedition teams uh, on our on our trips to Antarctica. And at the start of the trip, uh, invariably, as the expedition leader, I'll introduce I'll introduce the expedition team to all of our guests. And at first, when you meet them, you you recognise that they're your guides. They're they're your means to get you off the ship and and immerse you in the wild. But by the end of the trip. Uh, time and time again, our guests love the guides as much as I do. Uh, they are intelligent, they're capable, they're dedicated, and they're nature lovers who will join you on, on what I can only describe as the, the best scavenger hunt of your life. Uh, we train them to an incredibly high standard using a training package that uh, has been designed by our most senior guides, and, and we deliver the training as well. And because we have we have small ships um, because we have these beautiful small ships you can really get to know the expedition team and and your fellow guests and it's these small ships that can get you right into the best bits of the Antarctic and because we specialize in in only polar regions we we really know where these best bits are so I suppose uh, at the at the at the heart of it uh, it's our team and our philosophy to go off script, um, to embrace the, the spirit of the expedition that gives our guests the best chance to get into the wild and to see the best of Antarctica. So that's why I, um, I would hope that you'd consider coming to Antarctica um, with us. Uh, if there's no questions on that one, uh, Kok Young, can we have the next slide, please? So briefly about Antarctica, I wanted to talk about the, the two options that uh, we'll focus on tonight regarding how you can get to Antarctica. Next slide, please, Kofion. And there's two options highlighted on this map, and you'll see uh, that they're, they're quite different. One is uh, using the ship to get you to South Georgia, so go from the, the southern point of Argentina, sailing across to South Georgia and then coming back around to the Antarctic Peninsula all via a ship, noting that that's actually the only way you can get to South Georgia, you can't fly there. The other option is actually to fly from South America to Antarctica or to a, a, a set of islands just off the continent of Antarctica and there are, there are some really different aspects to this trip and I'll tell you a bit more about them later on um, but the the sailing trip to South Georgia leaves from uh, an Argentine town called Ushuaia and it starts with a pretty big or long sea transit to South Georgia and the advantage of this crossing is that you get the benefit of of the really outstanding education program that our expedition team give. So when you arrive in South Georgia, you can better appreciate what you're seeing because you, you've had that education and you understand it. I also kind of maybe a little bit romantically feel that you've earned your arrival. You appreciate what it takes to get to these wild and remote places. And 
you can sort of see how the explorers that came before us, the life that they would have had and the hardships that they would have had to endure, but you get to do it in a incredibly comfortable um, luxury ship. So it's, it's certainly a much better option, but it, it does make you appreciate what those uh, explorers endured. Uh, so after arriving at South Georgia that Kokyong just highlighted, we would spend a few days there and then sail all the way down to the Antarctic Peninsula and spend a few days on the continent. So I'll show you a little bit more about that one a little later on, but that's, that's an option. Another option also on this map is to depart from a small Chilean town called Punta Arenas and fly across the Drake Passage. The Drake Passage is that small body of water between the southern tip of Argentina and the Antarctic Peninsula. So you would fly over that and arrive in a small uh, airstrip on a Chilean military and scientific base on the South Shetland Islands, uh, King George Island specifically. Uh, and this, this trip really gives you the highlights of Antarctica. Uh, it's a fantastic experience condensed into a very short time frame. So you fly across the Drake Passage, there's, um, and in doing so, you reduce the time required for the trip. And also to a degree, I suppose you reduce the risk of getting seasick um, because you're flying onto the landing strip uh, on the Chilean base. Uh, this trip though, you do reduce the seasickness, but it's not without some risks because that Chilean base is on an island that can be prone to fog, which sometimes makes or delays the landing at the airstrip. So it's a bit of a trade-off, um, but both options will leave you absolutely wowed and, uh, and I'll tell you why a little bit, a little bit further on. Um, next slide, please, Kogyo. So uh, a lot of times I get asked, uh, what, what can I see during the early season of a trip? And what can I, when's the best time to go? And a little bit depends on, on what you most want to see. So if you get there in the early season, then it, it's kind of, it's, it's pristine and white and, and so magical in some ways because the, the winter has passed, spring has come, summer arrives and Antarctica wakes up. It's like it just comes alive again. The icebergs are huge, but they're starting to, they'll start to melt. So you'll hear them crackling and they'll start turning and you get this beautiful movement and the incredible blue color of them is, is just divine. That the pack ice is beginning to melt and that really changes the, the habitat of the animals the wildlife starts to return so you can see all of these incredible penguins just filling up the penguin colonies uh, so it's it's a really special time of the year and the penguins when they arrive of course they've got to start their um their courtship process so they will uh start flirting with each other and and start building their nests and it's uh it's it's just a a really interesting uh thing to stand there quietly listening to the icebergs rumble, listening to the glaciers carve and watching these penguins uh, fight over rocks and start their courtship and start to mate because uh, they've got a finite period where they have to build a nest, mate, lay an egg and raise a chick uh, all in the summer months. So you get to see the start of that process and it's, it's really quite special. So that's early season, November and December. Uh, next slide, please, Kofiam. If you go alternatively uh, in the sort of the, the mid-season time, uh, it's, it's a whole new ball game. It, there's a lot of differences. So you'll start to see the penguins with their eggs hatching and you might start to see uh, little chicks poking out. So it's, it's definitely uh, a busy time for the penguins. They start to hatch late December, just so you sort of get a good idea of when that is. The whales have also really, really come back to Antarctica at that time of year in the late season. And so you've got a better chance of seeing some um, really great whale feeding. 
uh, because of course they come down to Antarctica to feed. They breed in the warmer waters and come down to Antarctica just to be presented with this smorgasbord of food. Uh, so it's really nice time for that. There's a lot for photographers to enjoy at this period because the days are really, really, really long and uh, the temperatures are at their warmest as well. So, um, you know, the average, uh, I think, I think you guys do uh, Celsius, so I'll speak in Celsius, let me know if you need me to convert it, but the average temperature is sort of one to two degrees Celsius, but that's of course over night time too. Over daytime you can expect the temperature to get up to about four or five degrees often um, in these months, which is really lovely. Uh, next slide please, Kogyo. And at the end of this season, uh, again it's just, it's so different, uh, it doesn't look like the white pristine anymore because the snow has started to melt the penguins have have just been busy there are chicks penguin chicks running around everywhere crying for food trying to learn to swim uh going to the toilet everywhere so the snow is is a multi-colored mess and it's just glorious um so it's it's uh it's kind of like a very multicolored version of Antarctica. The pack ice has receded a lot more throughout the summer, so you can usually explore a little bit further south. So if that's one of your goals, then I would certainly recommend towards the end of the season. Uh, the whales are just trying to get in the, the rest of the food that they can possibly fit in their stomachs before they have to migrate north again, so they're active. The days are a little shorter by this time, but what that means is you get these stunning absolutely gorgeous sunset so it's a photographer's dream at that point um the glaciers are still active the icebergs are there uh and the the sun reflecting on them in those twilight hours is is just stunning the temperature starts to drop of course at the end of the season though so just be uh, be aware of that um so at the around march you'd probably get a daytime temperature of of one to two degrees celsius uh, next slide please go go so what I wanted to talk about here is the just breaking down those two different trips that we spoke about. Uh, and the first one is what we call the Antarctic Express. So this is where you fly over the Drake Passage. Uh, and what you get here again is, is, is quite a condensed time frame to see these incredible Antarctic sites. So um, it's kind of the highlights tour, I suppose. Um, you get to see a lot in a short amount of time. So if you are time strapped, then um, then I'd certainly recommend this trip to you. Uh, it's eight days uh, and you really do still get the opportunity to, you know, weather permitting, you get to stand on the continent. If, if that's one of your goals, you'll get to see those whales and you'll get to see those penguins uh, and, and really immerse yourself uh, in Antarctica and spend the whole time on that peninsula area, which is a really, really stunning, stunning area. Uh, next slide, please, Kokyong. There is, of course, uh, another option, which is uh, a little bit of a longer trip, but it's a similar experience in Antarctica. The difference being that you don't fly across the Drake Passage, you sail across it in one of the ships. And it's a two day sail, uh, one and a half to two day sail each way. Um, so you do get the benefit of that education program I spoke about earlier uh, and, you know, you get to sort of ease yourself into the trip and get that, that romantic feel of, of, of working hard to get to your destination. Um, the ships are incredibly comfortable. I'll speak to them a little bit more later on. Um, so it's, it's not a difficult journey. Uh, it's actually just a really... Um, a really nice way to to enter Antarctica and that trip's about 10 to 12 days similar very sort of very very similar experience on the actual continent um, and we've just got a couple of images now that's fine Kok Young. next slide please uh, that we wanted to put in just so we could um, show you what we mean and and one of my favorite things to do is to just be able to stand on the continent of Antarctica and just just remember where you are and how you got there it's it's such a small percentage of people that actually get the, the privilege of going to Antarctica and standing on that continent and to do it with a bit of peace and quiet around you 
except for the penguins. You can never get them to be quiet. But with the beasts and quiet and the penguins and looking out um, at the, the stunning, the water, which is, you know, it looks, it can look quite deceptive. If it's a calm day, you think, oh, it's just some nice, nice calm water. But underneath it is an, a thriving ecosystem that is sustaining an incredible amount of life in Antarctica and to stand there and be part of it, to be part of that ecosystem, but not, not affecting it negatively and uh, to be an observer in these remarkable places is just such a privilege. So to stand on the seventh continent in a, in a setting like that is, um, is a really humbling experience. So uh, that's certainly one of the highlights for me. Uh, next slide, please, Kogil. Another question we get asked a lot is what wildlife can we hope to see? Uh, certainly, uh, certainly we hope to see whales. We can never, um, never guarantee them, of course. They don't, they don't be waiting for us. Um, but the best way to see a whale is spend as much time as possible on the outer decks of the ship. And uh, when we show one of the, the images of the ship later on, you'll see that they're really beautifully set up to stand outside and watch watches the Antarctic world passes you by or you pass it by. And that's, uh, that's when you can really uh, experience some, some phenomenal whale sightings. Uh, of course, you, we'd hope to show you some penguin species. Uh, if you're looking at an Antarctic voyage to the peninsula, um, you definitely see the penguins featured in that image there, which is a Gentoo penguin, and probably one or two other species uh, you'd hope to see on a peninsula trip. Also some seals, there's maybe three or four different types of seals that you might want to see on, on these trips, and the one featured there is a, is a crab eater seal, and they, they're renowned for lying in groups of two to three uh, on ice flows, just like that one is there. So lots of beautiful wildlife to see, but um, so much more as well, wildlife and, and more, um, which we'll show in the coming slides. Next slide, please, Kofiong. And this is what I mean about more. There's, uh, it is just a winter wonderland in summer. The mountains are towering. They, they dwarf everything. You just feel like uh, it's, it's so indescribable. I really hope you come and, and then help me find the words to to make it sound better because I can't do it justice but you stand next to these incredibly large overwhelmingly big glaciers and you realize that we are just such a small part of this enormous planet where where nature rules and to to see that and to hear it and to smell it and to feel it uh is is truly remarkable so you'll see gorgeous glaciers icebergs maybe some pack ice which is the frozen ice um, that that really has a lot going underneath it uh, that feeds the ecosystem in Antarctica and you can sometimes do other things like join in some of our adventure activities we um, on some trips and, and just check with um, check with your agents which ones do it but on some trips we offer camping um, not on the fly-in trips so just uh, do check but camping on some trips there are other adventure activities like some water sports or paddling uh, and some options to really get you immersed in in nature if that's what you're interested in so lots to see and do so that sort of wraps up the Antarctic part of what we were speaking about specifically if you if you are a little bit time pressed and you just want to go to Antarctica they're your options but I would feel like an absolute fraud if I didn't speak to you about South Georgia, because if you are going to go all the way uh, to the very southern tip of South America uh, and then go even further to Antarctica, if you can afford the time, if you can, please, please consider going to South Georgia. Uh, it, it is, it, it's almost such a shame to go all that way and to miss this wonderland and and i'll just regale you with an anecdote very quickly before i'd been to south georgia my teammates kept saying oh i know you like antarctica allison but just wait till you get to south georgia and i thought no way there's nothing that can beat antarctica you can't wow me more than antarctica uh, i was wrong uh, south georgia is is just as wowing and more in other ways so i wanted to just give you a quick couple of highlights about south georgia um, you do get to see some of uh, the world's largest uh, king penguin rookeries um, and 
the rookeries there are much larger than the ones on the Antarctic Peninsula, and they're almost overwhelming. The the sheer numbers there are are really incredible for photographers, uh, especially, but just for anyone. You do spend a lot of time getting there. It's a long way. It's very remote, and most most trips to South Georgia, you'll need and, and Antarctic, you'll need eighteen to twenty days. But this particular one, this penguin safari, uh, which incidentally I'm the expedition leader for one of them, so look that up. Um, this one we can do in sixteen days. Uh, so if you are really keen but don't have the full twenty days, then then check this one out. Incredible populations of king penguins and elephant seals. I'll talk to you about those guys later. Uh, also some really beautiful history. Uh, and of course, one of my favorites and very undermentioned are the, the beautiful albatross there. Um, they, they, they blow my mind, these remarkable, beautiful birds. Uh, so lots, of, lots to see in South Georgia and my descriptions don't do it justice. So let's have a quick look at some photos. Um, maybe you'll still see some, some whales, but you are more likely to see them in Antarctica. But you will catch a couple of different penguin species. What's featured there are, are rockhopper penguins, uh, and then they've got some very similar looking ones, slightly smaller, called macaroni penguins as well. So those ones with the really comical looking uh, head uh, headgear there. Uh, and then on the bottom right there of the screen, you can see a baby fur seal. Uh, these guys are all bravado uh, and they come charging at you, thinking they're the toughest thing in the world, making these tiny little seal noises. Uh, they're just adorable uh, and, and they make me laugh every time. So lots of fur seals in Antarctica. They've really made a comeback since the old, the old sealing days. Uh, next slide, please, Kofiel. And of course, the history that I mentioned, uh, the history of the explorers, such as Ernest Shackleton, his, uh, his gravesite is there and you can visit and, and reflect upon his wonderful journey. Uh, and also a lot of whaling history. Uh, and this is a, a really incredible, rich history to try and understand and really gives you a good perspective on Antarctica and how it came to be if you understand the whaling history. Um, so lots to do there. Uh, again, if you are a lover of wildlife, then absolutely include South Georgia. Uh, can it, it is an absolute wildlife mecca, far more so than the, uh, the peninsula. And this image just shows you uh, one of the one of the penguin colonies. Uh, it, it's, it's just enormous. And, you know, what the image doesn't show you is the smell. Uh, it's unique, shall I say. Uh, it, it's not... I mean, it's not a smell you would bottle and use as a fragrance, but uh, it's it's not unbearable. It is just very unique to South Georgia and really completes the picture. But it's not just the smell, it's the sights and the sounds uh, and just standing amongst that is, is really incredible. Uh, next slide, please, Kok Young. So this is a quick video and um, if possible, can you push play on that one? It doesn't have any sound. Um, so I'll be able to talk over it. Um, if it doesn't work, it's it's fine. I'll just give it a second. Uh, but what this video shows you, if we can get it to work, is just, you know, it's not the highest quality video or anything. It was just taken by one of our guests. And what it shows is another guest who is just standing there. It's a, it's a foggy day. It's not, you know, blue skies. It's It's not always blue skies but it doesn't matter because you are there and you are in amongst the wildlife. Uh, we give them a really respectful five meters. Um, we don't approach them closer than five meters, but they don't read the rules. So if they approach you closer than five meters, then you just get to enjoy this moment where you're not seeing a penguin in a zoo. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that here. You are you are at their home. We are just a visitor in in their domain, and and there's something really special about about being part of that ecosystem and and seeing them in their natural habitat, happy as all get out. Uh, so it's a really special special place and a special time to be able to stand quietly and reflect and just be part of it. Um, if that that one doesn't work, that's no worries. Can we go to the next slide, please, Kofi? Uh, this one is a video too, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't work because it really shows you uh, what what can happen if you just sit quietly uh, and and enjoy being part of the uh, part of the environment. So that's one of our other expedition leaders, Laurie, and she was just sitting 
at the beach and you can see that there's a guest behind her as well um, in the yellow parka. And Laurie was sitting there minding her own business and this little baby elephant seal just came up to her and, and they're inquisitive. They've, they don't have any, they're, they're big when they grow up. They don't have predators on land. So they're not afraid of things. We, of course, we try not to scare them, but it just crawled its way up to her. And you can see it's got these massive, big eyes and it, that's because they're, they're deep divers in the water so they need to have big lenses to let the light in but on land they just use those big eyes to look at you and melt your heart it's incredible um, so this elephant seal baby came up to Laurie and just started sniffing her and and that was really special but also if you look around you'll see that you know, the rest of it is, is special as well. She's sitting there enjoying the penguins and then all of a sudden had an elephant seal encounter. But even if she wasn't enjoying the penguins, she could be enjoying the beautiful glaciers that you can see and the ice that's around her uh, and this remote wilderness that, uh, that lives uh, in South Georgia. So it's really just part of a really, really fantastic big picture there. Uh, thanks so much, Kokyo. Next slide. Uh, I did promise to briefly mention uh, the some of the vessels that we use, and this is our uh, this is our newest one. It actually hasn't hasn't formally launched yet. It's called the Ultramarine, and if if uh, we are allowed to travel. Um, come June, July, uh, then I'll have the privilege of being the expedition leader on this ship in the Arctic this season. If we don't get to travel, then we'll certainly be able to use it as soon as we can travel again. And the incredible thing about this ship is that uh, this is Quark's first ship that we've built for ourselves and we've designed it. And when I say we've designed it, I mean the shipbuilders have given us advice, but the features have been uh, have been really defined by the expedition team. That is the people who use the ship every day. And we had, we designed it with one main, main thing in mind. And that was ironically to get you off it. The main feature of this ship is that it allows us to access the most remote areas. It's got some really key technical features that allow us to go further and deeper and farther and really go off the uh, off the script and find the most stunning places um, and allows us to deploy our zodiacs quickly to get you into the water and into the wild. So that's the thing I love most about it. Uh, my marketing team um, they love a lot of other things about it, like the beautiful dining rooms and the fantastic TV screens. And they're all, they're all really good. But to my mind, I want to get on this ship so we can have a really comfortable journey to this beautiful place so we can get off the ship. Uh, so I hope that, I hope that makes sense, that uh, distinction there. Next slide, please. Of course, another feature of this ship is that it has two helicopters and uh, we are one of the first, if not the one of the first companies to to be down in Antarctica offering this feature uh, equipped, equipped with two twin engine heli uh, helicopters. So just another different perspective on Antarctica that we're really excited about. Um, get you quickly into the wild and uh, the uh, next slide, please. There, Kokyong. There are a lot of creature comforts, absolutely. It feels like you're in a five star hotel. Um, so it is incredibly comfortable. All of our ships are incredibly comfortable. Um, but I can't lie to you guys, it's not, it's not what does it for me. It's not the selling point. The selling point is that they can get us to Antarctica and uh, we can get out exploring. Um, Despite that, uh, the ship is is beautiful. The food on board is wonderful, but we are not we are not trying to be a very formal um, formal company. We're not trying to be. Yes, of, of course, we are. We all have manners and we all behave well in the dining room, but uh, we are not a you know a fine uh, fine dining, very formal company. There's other companies that will give you that service. We don't put a ball gown on to go to dinner. Um, you know, we dress appropriately, but our intention is to get out and explore. Uh, and this ship is a very, very comfortable, beautiful way to go and do that. So I really can't wait to uh, wait to get on the ship. And, and I hope we get to go to Antarctica and her this season. 
I think that was the main points I wanted to cover tonight. Um, I'm really happy to take questions or Kokyung, we can uh, wait to the end if you'd like, but thank you everyone for your time so very, very much. Uh, I hope, I hope I've uh, inspired you to consider a trip to Antarctica because it is, it is just a life changing place uh, that I'm absolutely in love with. And I, I hope you'll fall in love with it too. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Alison, for your, um, for your deep, uh, deep insights on, on life in Antarctica. So uh, on that, I would like to bring on the next speaker, Patrick. Uh, Patrick is the, maybe just a little introduction about Patrick. So he has been to South Pole in 2002, and he has climbed um, the Tibet mountains. He has kayak into the Amazon rivers, and he has a private plane license as well. So, and he has, he's the, he has set up the White Desert Company, and uh, this is an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, example of a uh, uh, trip that you can imagine that to get into Antarctica. Without further ado, let me uh, hand over the mic to uh, Patrick to show you uh, about the journeys with White Deserts. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen uh, with you all uh, to show you my presentation. So give me two seconds. Okay, I think we're there. Okay, I, I hope you guys can all see this um, and welcome everybody and uh, thank you for tuning in to listen to this. So um, I'm the CEO of White Desert, and uh, we offer a, a, a quite a different trip to what Alison's been describing over at Quark, where um, that obviously takes place on the peninsula and is by vessel and is sea-oriented. Um, what we do is all about the interior of Antarctica. So um, our, our entire trips were generated from uh, really one moment. And where it all started was I was, I was doing an expedition to cross Antarctica. So I've skied about 4,000 kilometers across the interior. And I was thinking to myself, why is it that it's only polar explorers and the odd scientists that get to see the deep field, get to go into the interior of Antarctica, uh, which I thought was an incredibly special place. So after that expedition finished, we set up White Desert. And the idea was to bring a sort of uh, South African luxury safari um, into the interior of Antarctica. And for the last 15 years, we've been doing exactly that. Now, to give you a map, we don't operate out of South America um, where all the cruise ships operate. We operate from Cape Town, uh, Cape Town, South Africa, which is a stunning location to begin any holiday. Cape Town as itself, I'm looking out my window right now, it's hot and sunny uh, with vineyards and mountains and beaches. And it's a, it's a tourist destination in and of itself. We then fly five hours to our own runway in a Gulfstream 550 jet. So the idea is to take you into the Antarctic quickly. Uh, it's a five hour flight, that's it. And we take you straight into the interior of Antarctica. And the runway we built, uh, we operate it and run it. And it's, as I say, it's a very short flight that has been uh, designed for a private jet. And then we have two camps. You can either stay at our Wichaway Oasis, which is our premium luxury camp, or you can stay at Wolfsfang, where we've set up an explorer camp. And then once we're in the interior of Antarctica, our main focus is reaching the lowest point on Earth, the geographic South Pole, and then also an incredible emperor penguin colony of nearly 28,000 penguins. So it's an un unbelievable place. Now in the interior, obviously you have 24 hours of sunshine. So it's literally daylight, 24 hours a day. Um, and it's, uh, as Alison said, it's a, it's a very, very special place, Antarctica. So here we are in Cape Town. This is where our journey begins. And I'm sure many of you know all about Cape Town, so I won't dwell on that. And we fly in a G550. So the reason why this plane is so special, not just the luxury on board, but because we have the ability to fly all the way down to our runway, and if the weather is wrong uh, and we got things wrong, we can t return all the way back to Cape Town safely. Now, last season, we did 32 flights uh, into Antarctica and only six of them were delayed by 24 hours. So we operate to a very, very tight schedule. 
here's the G550 on the ice and you can see what it's like inside. And then this is it at Wolfsfang runway. From Wolfsfang, we fly you in a uh, smaller plane to our camp here. Now this is Witcherway camp. You can see it just down here on the, on the uh, bottom of the picture here. And it's on this unbelievable oasis called the Schirmacher Oasis of rock where we've got natural lakes, ice falls, pressure ridges. It, it, it is almost kind of lunar and I would describe it as being uh, the closest to being off the planet as you can be without actually leaving Earth. So Witcherway Camp is designed for 12 guests. That's it. We only take 12. It's incredibly bespoke experience. We have actually 75 Antarctic staff members in Antarctica running around, moving fuel, um, opening up ski ways, making things happen. Um, and of that, we have 17 different nationalities. So we employ, it's a really multinational team employing Chinese, Russian, English, South African, American, just a huge spectrum of different nationalities. And that's very much the feel of what our camp is like. And the service, as you can imagine, with that many staff members for only 12 guests is impeccable. Now, a little bit about something that's very true to our heart, and that's obviously the sustainability. We, we recognize that we are operating in a, in a very, very pristine wilderness. And since 2005, when I set the company up, we've very much taken the view of Sir David Attenborough. And as you'll see there on the screen, he said, no one will protect what they don't care about, and no one will care about what they have never experienced. So that's very, very much our philosophy, which means that we really do build ambassadors who come into Antarctica. We also utilize our logistics. So our planes are shared with scientists. So we're, we're delivering scientists to their bases, all sorts of different scientists. Uh, we worked with Chinari, the, the Chinese national program quite extensively last year of delivering um, people to their stations where they obviously conduct lots of science work. So that's very important. But for our own business, we've been carbon neutral and we're also trialing sustainable aviation fuel uh, in our planes. Uh, our camps are, remo are removable, so they would leave no trace when we leave Antarctica and are solar powered. And, and more than that, we remove every single item of waste from Antarctica every season we operate. So that's a huge part of what we do. Now onto the, the, the flight times, you know it's five hours from Cape Town to uh, Wolfsvang. But then to fly to the South Pole itself is a further seven hours. And then it's a two hour flight to the Emperor Penguins. We can also operate from South America uh, by doing exclusive trips. However, uh, we do that very rarely. That's just usually for people who want to bring in their own private jets. Now, a little bit about camps. This is Witchaway, our, our main luxury camp. And here, as you can see, there are, it usually accommodates 12 guests, two people in each pod. But we also have some spare pods in case people want to have single supplements. There's a beautiful lounge din dining room with amazing food. We have an incredible chef, beautiful wines from Cape Town. Uh, this year, we've also built a yoga pod and a sauna as well. And this is a, really the, the base camp for your adventure. To give you an idea of the dining room, uh, the bedrooms, and the shower rooms. So that gives you an idea of what it's like. And then we have a second camp called Witcherway Explorer, which is by our runway. And this is, this is more catering towards a bit more of the adventurous type. So here we have uh, tents. Uh, they are heated and very comfortable, but they're still tents. And again, uh, lounge library room. And then here, this is inside the sleeping, sleeping tents. And from there, on your base camp, you then go off on an adventure each day. So we have three different guides for each adventure, for each group. And this is them at the ice bar, uh, monkeying around. And our guides are unbelievable. Um, a lot of them have world records themselves. Um, they're all uh, UIGM certified high mountain guides. And these are the guys that are gonna take you on your daily activities. And what's really important to, to mention is that, you know, this isn't for polar explorers. We've had a, a, a 10 year old girl, who, for a Saudi princess, no less, who'd never seen snow before we'd had an 85 year old man come to our camp. So, you know, the, the age range is huge. You know, you don't need to be a tough marathon runner to come to do what we do. Um, it's really about just experiencing it. Now, some of the experiences we offer are the crystal caves, which are right by our camp. We have glacier walks up to nearby summits. 
We also have the Blue River, which is this iridescent blue crystal river. It's absolutely stunning location. And imagine again, there's only 12 of you on any experience. So you're always getting out into the field and experiencing what you want to experience. My personal favorite is the ice tunnels. These are iridescent blue. They really do look like this. We haven't messed with the photo in any way. And it's just this incredible blue, raw blue from these meltwater tunnels. And they're about 200 meters long. So you can go down and explore these wonderful, wonderful tunnels. Then these pressure ridges. These are very, very rare in Antarctica and they're right beside Wichaway Camp. And these are entire ridges which we go off and explore each day. Now, I'm, ex I'm showing you a lot more of the sort of harder activities. We also do four by four or six by six safaris where we utilize our vehicles to drive on, as you would like a South African safari experience. We have fat bikes at camp, which are good fun to keep fit. And we also do lighter stuff, even weddings. And we've done a few of those over the past few years. For the more adventurous stuff, as we've said, skiing, skidoo riding, ice climbing, rope walks, abseiling, virgin summits, all that kind of stuff can be very energetic, or as I say, it can be much softer, uh, softer adventure. Now the highlight of the, the activity is using this plane, our DC-3 Basler, we have two of these aircraft, and this plane uh, then flies us on to the South Pole itself. Now, this is the lowest point on earth. Uh, this is the holy grail of all the early explorers, what Shackleton, Scott Amundsen, all the guys, uh, what I tried to do back in my youth as well, or, or succeeded in doing, is reaching this place. You can walk around the world in a couple of paces. Once you get to the South Pole, every direction on the world is simply north. There's no more east, south or west. It's a very, very surreal place. And here you can see the American science base at the South Pole. And as you can see, it's a place for celebration. It's a very, very rare thing to get to the South Pole. Even now, the numbers are uh, about a couple of hundred people every year get to the South Pole. So it's really rare and really difficult. So the South Pole is one of the major parts of our adventure. And then the next place is the Emperor Penguins. Now, these aren't like the King or a Delhi or the uh, Chin Strap or any of the ones you'll see on the peninsula. These are the emperors. And they're the largest penguin, and these are the ones that stay over winter. And they have an extraordinary breeding cycle. Now, because we fly into Antarctica, we're able to access the penguin colony really early in the season when the chicks are at their smallest and greyest. And they have never been hunted. They're entirely unafraid of humans. Um, and they're absolutely beautiful. As I say, 28,000 penguins, and we're about the only tourists that go there. So it's a really very, very special place. And the other thing we also sometimes see later in the season is Weddell seal. Now they come up through the ice and they use their teeth to grind breathing holes. And so you see these colossal seals sitting on the ice right next to you. So the wildlife is really, really special uh, where we are in Antarctica. So to just recap on the, the trips we do offer, we have a South Pole and Emperor's program, which is our main itinerary. This is the one that we do the most. Uh, and it is an extraordinary trip into the interior of Antarctica. We priced that at $83,000 per person staying at Wolfsfang, and then $96,000 staying at our luxury camp, Witchaway. This includes everything from when you leave Cape Town. Um, the entire trip is, is, is all inclusive. Um, and as I say, this is, this is the, the main trip we offer. We also aim to focus on the early emperors as well with a six day trip, which is slightly cheaper because you don't go to the South Pole. Again, it's all inclusive. Uh, and this is really something for major uh, photographer enthusiasts. This is really, really what we pitched it at. Um, and finally, for those that have their own private jet, we have the ability to land your own jet uh, at our runway. And then we have built a special camp that is purely for private jet, owner, uh, jet owners called Echo Camp that we're launching this coming season. So that's it from me. I'll be delighted to take uh, questions from anyone. And uh, may I just say thank you very much to everybody for listening to me speak. Thank you very much indeed.